The first case of COVID-19 was officially reported on 31st of December 2019 in Wuhan, China. On 30th January 2020, the outbreak was declared as a public health emergency of international concern by WHO. On 31st of January 2020, the first UK case was confirmed in Yorkshire. On 11th of February, the WHO announced the name for new coronavirus disease as COVID-19. So far, we have seen over 6 million cases of COVID-19 and 375,554 global deaths so far. UK has seen 277,985 cases so far and uh, 39,369 deaths so far. Daily cases reported yesterday were 1,613 and 324 deaths yesterday, 2nd of June. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vineet Johri. I'm delighted to introduce my guest for today's show. So let me introduce uh, my guest for today's show. I have got Dr. Ramesh Mehta, uh, President Papio. He's with me. And I have uh, Dr. Anik Bhai, uh, doctor at North Park Hospital. I have Ash Balachandran, uh, who is a um, coronavirus sufferer. And I have Bahi, she is sister Hello. of the uh, uh, working at uh, Tankos Hospital. So before we uh, continue, I would like uh, to request my guests to please introduce themselves if they possibly can. So uh, can I start with Dr. Mehta, please? All right. Hi, Vineet, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Ramesh Mehta. I'm a retired consultant pediatrician and importantly i am founder of an organization called british association of physicians of indian origin that is bapio this was launched in 1996 and in 24 years we've been challenging the establishment and government on equality on discrimination on racism. And um, during this COVID, we have been playing a very important role to ensure that the BME staff, healthcare workers, are looked after properly. So that's me. Right. And then um, can I ask uh, Anik uh, to introduce, if possible? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Anik Guy. I'm a, a junior doctor and I'm currently working at Northwick Park Hospital uh, in London. So uh, I graduated five years ago, I uh, graduated from UCL and uh, I have actually been working at the hospital which is probably one of the few hospitals in London that has been hardly hit uh, by coronavirus. Right, uh, Ash, is it possible for you to introduce yourself for us? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ash, uh, Ash Balakrishnan. Uh, you can say I'm an entrepreneur, I've got several business interests. I'm quite active in the UK India corridor and I'm also uh, a Tech London advocate. Of, I've got a, a soft spot for uh, technology. That's just a little bit about myself. And uh, Behi, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Bahi. Um, I used to be a dental nurse, now I'm a uh, beauty therapist, and I'm so glad to be uh, in this conversation with you guys. Right, okay. So now we know a little bit about our guests. Let me start uh, the discussion with my very first question with uh, Dr. Mehta. I mean, during uh, this past 10, 12 weeks, maybe a bit more, uh, we have seen a lot of BAME uh, background medical staff uh, have lost their life and they, 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 there's hardly any any detail on why, why this is happening i mean as a doctor what do you think what is happening and why bame why is this background particularly okay i think that's a very good question so far we estimate that over 200 healthcare workers 
working or had been working in NHS have died because of Corona virus. Now, why BME uh, healthcare workers are dying more than white workers, we don't have clear idea at the moment. However, we had done a survey in mid-April and we had 2,000 doctors replying as to the possible reasons. Now, we of course know that age is an important factor and those who are over 65 are much more likely to have the disease itself. And when the disease is there, it is likely to be a lot more serious. Comorbid conditions like other diseases. So people who have diabetes or high blood pressure or asthma, you know, diseases like these, and also any immunosuppression disease, they are likely to have more. And of course, some of the healthcare workers have had these comorbid conditions. But, you know, we need, importantly, our survey showed that being BME itself is a independent risk factor. Now, you might know that only yesterday, the Public Health England published their report of what has been happening since COVID was seen in, in, in UK. And they have confirmed that just being BME is an independent risk factor. Now, coming back to other possible reasons, you know, this government has been very slow to act and they were not at all prepared to face this huge pandemic of a virus which is not seen. Now, from our survey, it was very clear that the protective equipment that should have been available to all the doctors and not only doctors, but all the frontline workers were not available. Unfortunately, even now, after a couple of months, still we don't have proper equipment available to the doctors and the healthcare workers. The other issue that probably is responsible is social distancing is not possible in the hospital. And Anik, I'm sure, would explain that when you are working in the hospital setup, you can't keep two meters distance between you, patient, nurses, and so on. So that is another important reason. But we are still looking at it. A lot more research needs to be done. And why BME, being BME itself is an independent factor, whether it is vitamin D deficiency, whether it is genetics, whether it is something else, we need to find that out. Okay, very interesting to hear that. Um, can I can I move on to Anik? Uh, and, uh, and we have been uh, watching the news for past few months, and every other day we hear about North Park Hospital. Mm -hmm. And while you're working in the hospital itself, and um, we've seen that this uh, hospital has been uh, uh, an epicenter for the for the pandemic, I would say, uh, uh, more than twice, if, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and they were sending patients away from the hospital. While you're already in the, in the hospital, can you can you suggest why Norfolk Park Hospital? What is happening there? What is the reason? I, I think there's several reasons uh, to explain that. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sure. So I think one of the reasons is that quite early on, uh, at least within London, Northwick Park was identified as one of the first hubs where any patient suspected of having coronavirus would be screened. So we do have quite a large infectious disease unit. And so we were initially asked by Public Health England to be one of the first centres to actually uh, take in any patients coming in from uh, Heathrow Airport. So we're obviously quite close proximity to Heathrow. So we're one of the first centres. That's the first uh, answer. The second answer is, if you also look at the risk factors, as Dr. Mehta actually has also suggested, um, being of the BME 
uh, demographic is an independent risk factor. And if you look at Northwick Park and the surrounding boroughs, we do have a large demographic of uh, patients belonging to those uh, ethnic backgrounds. So we have a lot of Asians uh, in Harrow, for instance. And that can help explain also why um, we do have a large number of patients uh, with the coronavirus. And also we do have a large aging population as well. So being from the ethnic background, together with also an aging population, those in itself are um, reasons to suggest why we have a large number of patients being admitted with coronavirus in Harrow. Okay, that's, that's, that, that gives a better picture of why in Norfolk Park actually. Uh, maybe I can move on to Ash and, and uh, ask him uh, basically, what is his lifestyle? What does he do? And uh, tell tell us a bit more about yourself before we move on to knowing what you went through in the past few months. Sure. So uh, just just tell you a little bit um, about myself. Like, so in my network, I'm seen as like this super connector because I'm constantly out and about. I'm constantly bringing people together, getting people to collaborate. And um, you know, as far as kind of uh, health wise, I. I I try to keep healthy. I try to go to the, the gym three, four times a week. Um, I don't smoke. I drink occasionally. Uh, I like my food. Chocolate's my guilty pleasure, you could say. But I, I try to look after myself in, in, in general. And um, the uh, so and I do have a I have mild asthma, but you know I carried my asthma pump around with me. Um, but it's like something that I use maybe half a dozen times a year, if that. Um, so I. I remember when you know news broke about the the virus, and they were telling people to be quite cautious. And and to, to be honest, I, I just didn't take it kind of serious. I just thought uh, I never let it kind of stop me from from going about my business or my day. Um, if I had meetings in London, I'd still continue going to meetings in London. I, I, if I I still carried on going to the gym, even though I know I knew friends who literally, as of January, decided that they weren't no longer going to be visiting the gym because they saw it as potentially uh, an area where they can kind of uh, where the germs were spreading um but yeah i, I just thought I, I i thought i was relatively quite fit and i just didn't think that i would be exposed to the uh, to the virus you know mm. okay. that's interesting to hear um let me move on to Bahi and, and ask her basically how it is like to be the family member of a care worker she her sister works as a nurse at charing cross hospital if i'm not wrong Tell us how it is like to be the sister of a care worker or a nurse, nursing staff. Um, well, at first, obviously, uh, we didn't expect it to be this serious and we thought it's just like a temporary um, situation. And uh, since we live together with my sister and the whole family, my mom and dad, um, at first, um, it was not that serious to us, but then again, we heard many people are dying around the world and um, she was telling us about um, how um, they close the ward and it's only for COVID patients and um, they have so many COVID patients and uh, most of them are dying because of the old age or the health condition. So we started getting worried and um, she was working very hard under so much stress and um, they, weren't, they, they didn't have proper PPE at first and which we were very worried about. Um, but then it was uh, very stressful and we weren't sure what's going to happen and the long hours of work they were doing and um, obviously the main problem was they didn't have proper PPE. But it was very stressful, very stressful for my parents, to be honest, because they are kind of old. So she was coming home after work and we just tried to separate my mom and dad from her. But obviously it just doesn't work. Um, so we were very worried, very worried. I can imagine, I can, this must have been a really stressful time. Yeah. Probably I can, I can move back to Dr. Mehta uh, if, if I can. Um, Dr. Mehta, we have got about 65,000 Indian origin doctors working for NHS. And uh, I was trying to find out this information that out of this uh, proportion that so many BME doctors have lost their lives, 
how many were Indians. I couldn't really get a clear picture of what percentage uh, was Indian doctors who have lost their lives. Is it possible for you to uh, give us some details on that? Okay. Um, I think um, we've been on the whole bit fortunate uh, as far as the Indian doctors are concerned. So far, as we know, over 30 doctors died because of COVID-19. Our information at the moment is out of these, only six Indian doctors passed away. Um, most of these doctors uh, were um, quite senior, actually, um, over 70 years of age. Uh, the youngest one who passed away, unfortunately, a lady uh, who was 56 years old. Uh, but, you know, it's very unfortunate. And we, as I said, we don't understand why um, BME doctors and healthcare workers are affected more. But majority of the doctors dying were either Afro-Caribbean origin or Middle Eastern origin or Eastern Asian origin. So that is the East, East Asia is Philippines and that that region. Okay, that's, that's uh, interesting to hear. Uh, maybe I can move on to Anik and um, as a frontline person at Norfolk Park, you must be seeing yeah. a lot of people coming in and then um, uh, being admitted. So could you take us through the journey of a patient from the time he arrives to the time he's discharged or not able to make it whichever way? Can you take us through the journey? What happens? How does it work? Yeah, sure. So I think a lot of people, um, they obviously hear about patients deteriorating from coronavirus. But a lot of people don't actually understand what do they die from or how do they deteriorate. So usually what happens is, first of all, um, uh, sorry, Vineet, you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag on my side. So what happens is, before I go through the actual journey, one thing which I should just let you know about is what does coronavirus actually do? to patients and how do they deteriorate and why do they deteriorate? So firstly, what coronavirus does, it causes um, what we call a viral humanitis. So in medicine, anything that ends in itis generally refers to as inflammation. So um, with viral humanitis, it's a viral etiology or viral in origin and pneumo meaning the lung. So it causes inflammation of the lungs. So the main reason why patients deteriorate is because of essentially their lungs not functioning as they should be and how that manifests is usually them not getting enough oxygen in their blood so when the lungs are not working effectively what happens is the oxygen levels in the blood start to go down and their work of breathing goes up so when we're actually seeing patients as they walk in the key symptoms we're actually looking for are first of all breathlessness and objectively, we measure that by checking how much oxygen there is in the blood. And we usually do that in two ways. One is actually putting a probe on your finger called a pulse oximeter. And the other thing is what we can also do is take a blood test to check how much oxygen there is in the blood. So when a patient first comes into hospital, obviously not every patient deteriorates. So we have to triage them and assess, does this patient, first of all, have to... Uh, be admitted or can we safely send them home? If every single patient suspected of coronavirus gets admitted, obviously we wouldn't have beds left in the hospital. So we need an effective triaging service to be able to determine who's actually um, sick enough that they need to stay in hospital. So we usually check something known as their breathing rate and we also check their oxygen levels together with other symptoms as well. So if a patient's oxygen level is low, that's an indication for us to admit the patient. So that's sort of the first part. They come into a &E, they get assessed by the a &E doctors, and the a &E doctors need to decide, are they sick enough to be admitted or not? Now, let's just say they are sick enough and they do need to be admitted. We then need to understand how severe um, are they essentially. So usually when patients um, have coronavirus and they do get a viral pneumonitis, what we need to understand is, 
Um, first of all, what level of care do these patients need? Some patients have a mild infection, and by this I mean they don't actually, they have the virus, but they don't necessarily need any treatment. Um, so that means they don't need any supplementary oxygen, whereas some patients, they're very ill and they need to be treated with um, supplementary oxygen, meaning that could be um, essentially oxygen through a face mask, or if they're very unwell, it could mean that they need higher flow of oxygen or higher concentrations of oxygen. So when we're trying to understand what is the patient flow, it really does depend on how much oxygen they require. So when you're asking about what happens to a patient from when they're being admitted to being discharged, it, it all depends on how severe their, their actual symptoms are. So um, initially they can be on a medical ward uh, if they don't need much oxygen, but if they do deteriorate and they need higher oxygen, they can end up going to wards where there's high level of monitoring. That includes, um, some people will probably know, intensive care, or it could mean um, HD, which is a otherwise known as high dependency unit. And that's usually um, how we decide on whether patients go into ITU, HDU or medical ward is by basing their question on uh, how unwell they are from their breathing point of view. So supposedly if a patient's um, doing all right, doesn't need a lot of oxygen, we can send them home. So we usually have a criteria in hospital on patients with coronavirus, who can we send home? So as long as their oxygen levels are high enough, as long as their breathing rate isn't high enough, we can be sure that yes, they've got the virus, but they can actually be safely discharged. Now, if patients need increasing oxygen levels, we then have to escalate their treatment to um, higher other forms of treatment, such as for instance, um, ventilation, or it could be also um, machines called CPAP. And that's really um, how we sort of assess uh, usually um, when do we need to actually escalate treatment? Hmm. Okay. That's, that's quite insight of what exactly goes on in there. And how do you communicate with the families in this time? I mean, what happens? The family obviously is not allowed to come and visit their uh, family members. So how does it work? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, you are quite right. So family members are not allowed to visit. Um, so even at this point in time, uh, we are not having any visitors uh, to see their relatives. So usually what happens is we do try to, quite recently actually, um, the trust have started getting iPads on the wards uh, for loved ones to be able to FaceTime um, their relatives. All right, now we move on to Ash, actually. Let's quickly try and bring Ash uh, in, in, in limelight and ask him something about his experience during um, this time. I mean, he was in the hospital for a good uh, five, six weeks, if I'm not wrong. So can you take us through your journey of this five to six weeks when you were in the hospital, how it started and what you went through and how it ended? Yeah, I'll just, um, I'll start a week before I went into hospital. So it was, um, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, I, I'd i never thought that I would be a, a, you know, a victim of the virus. And um, so it was the week commencing 16th of March where I started feeling unwell, um, body was aching, I had a temperature. But at the time, I think a lot of the um, the, the websites and, and in the news and stuff, they, they kept talking about this cough and I never had the cough. But um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I did have mild asthma. So as the week progressed, um, I found I was struggling to, to breathe. I found it more and more difficult to breathe. So it was um, Sunday 22nd of March where I actually rang the ambulance and I said, look, you know, I can't breathe. I feel like my body's breaking down. Uh, and they came, they, uh, they assessed me. They, they could tell I had the high temperature. So I got taken into hospital on the Sunday 22nd of March where Sunday evening they did tests on me. Um, Monday morning, I got they they got the results and uh, you know I, I thought because I was having trouble breathing and I've got mild asthma, I just thought that they were going to put me on some sort of oxygen machine. Uh, I'd be there for maybe a night, maybe a couple of hours, and I'd be home, you know, within a day or two max. Um, so Monday, the twenty third of March, um, they came to my um, bed in the morning and the doctor said that we were going to 
put me to sleep for a couple of hours so I thought, uh, to help me with my breathing. So I just thought, yeah, that, that's fine. And then the, the next memory that I have um, was waking up on Easter Sunday. So three weeks later, uh, I'd been on a ventilation machine. Um, the doctors had tried pretty much everything, trying to provide me with lots of different medications and trying. And because, and, and, as we all know, there's no um, there's no cure for the disease at the moment. So you know they were doing their best to kind of pull me through it. And I, I think the the signs weren't looking great. But but it's, it's it's interesting because on the actual the actual Sunday when I did wake up, I, I actually woke up and I, I vomited. My body was sweating head to toe. Uh, and I, again, I just felt my body was breaking down. I couldn't breathe. There was no oxygen machine. Again, due to um, the, you know, lack of equipment, uh, there just wasn't enough equipment available. Um, and uh, there was a doctor who, there was one doctor, the first doctor who came and saw me actually he said, Ash, looked me in the eyes and said, Look, Ash, we've given you every medication. Um, nothing's working. What would you like me to do? What do you want me to do? And, and I could tell in his eyes that he, he pretty much kind of given up at that moment in time, that, that particular doctor. Because, and I feel I, I didn't hold it against him, but I, it was just because I think, you know, what the doctors and nurses are kind of going through in hospitals, like they've never been through anything like this before. There's no rule book. There's no, um, you know, there's no cure. And they can say, yep, this is what we need. And uh, yeah, the doctor basically, he, 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 he you know, he just felt it, there was, that is as far, um, that is the most that he could have done with me. And I think it was, uh, there was, I was given a time of like one hour to survive. Uh, I thought I was, I was off. And I was just very fortunate that um, uh, one of my aunt's friends happened to work in intensive care at the time. And she kind of, uh, she was starting her shift on Easter Sunday. So I was a, I was a mess and uh, she took over the show. And uh, yeah, I had to, like the next morning when I woke up, I had to kind of pinch myself really to, that I was alive. And, and the doctor came and sat down with me and said, do you know what you've been through? And I was just like, look, I remember going to sleep and that was it. And he was like, yeah, well, you've been in induced coma for three weeks. And I just, I was just like, couldn't believe it, you know, being asleep for three weeks. Um, and uh, yeah, they said, you know, pretty much as I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, they they tried lots of different medications throughout that period. Nothing was working. Um, I, 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 as I'm going to give credit to the medical staff that helped me uh, through that process. But the doctor openly said to me, he said, it's a miracle you're alive. Uh, if you don't believe in God now, start believing in God. And I just feel that at that moment in time, there was a, a lot of friends, a lot of family, all kind of praying for me, wishing for me to kind of get better, um, you know, sending me healing. Uh, so I think, you know, I've, I've got to kind of thank the power of prayer as well in this, you know, I think that was something that kind of pulled me through it. So, uh, yeah, that, that was like my the, the first half of my coma. But as I, as I mentioned, I, you know, even to, to be told that I had the virus, I was shocked because I, I just didn't feel, not that I was immune to it, but I just felt because of my lifestyle, you know, I generally kind of keep healthy. Um, I wash my hands. I'm very hygienic. My friends are a bit, a bit OCD in that sense. Um, so I just didn't feel like I'd be kind of exposed to it. But it, I think having asthma didn't help as well. So it, I was told that the it, it, it did, the virus started attacking my lungs, and that's why I was struggling to breathe. But um, probably because of my age, I was the youngest patient in intensive care at the time. I'm, I'm 38 now. And um, I think they probably expected me to probably like, you know, Maybe a week on the on the um, uh, ventilator, and then they thought they, that I'd probably pull through. But and I don't think they they thought I'd be as long as I did, which was like you know three weeks. And and um, as I said, you know the signs were really pointing the other way. It looked like I was going downhill. But um, I'm glad I could tell the story with a smile on my face. And, and do you remember anything when you were in coma for those three weeks? Do you remember any any thoughts, any dreams, anything? Yeah, what so was the, happening in that time? Uh, yeah. So interestingly. So during the coma, I had lots of different dreams, and even in the dreams, I'm I'm basically I'm dying. So I I, um, I visited a temple in India, and I'm praying in the temple, saying God save me. Um, I went to a church, I'm praying in the church, saying Jesus save me, I'm dying. I went to a mosque, saying Allah save me, I'm dying, and praying with all different people, you know. And I was in a gurdwara, uh, praying again, um, and uh, yeah. So I, I just feel like at that time that I was being um, Kind of led to these places of you know beautiful places of worship through people who were rooting for me in the outside world you could say you know um and and then yeah i saw uh i saw my best friend lifting my coffin coming out of my home i saw speeches at my funeral i saw uh my uh, family member of, of mine who passed away like my 
two of my uncles, my grandma, my grandfather. And yeah, it was quite a, so when I, when I came back around, um, you know, it was, it, people say to me, do you feel like you've died and come back? And I, I don't know if I've died and come back, but it was definitely, it definitely felt like a near death experience. Right. Okay. Maybe I can I can ask Betty a bit more about her sister's experience as a nurse. What she shares when she comes home, especially uh, when you when they wear PPE kit. Um, and, and I've seen on TV that this is quite a lot that people have to wear. What she says and what she talks to you about that experience. Um, she says that um. There are a lot of people are dying, and um, as um, as you guys mentioned, there's no cure for it at the moment. So uh, they don't have any specific medications to give to patients, and um, they just have to um, look after the patients and um, just make sure they do their best. Um, and it's very stressful and strange experience, I would say, that um, everyone is going through, especially doctors and nurses. Um, they are definitely under so much pressure. And um, um, we just have to pray for them, to be honest. Uh, I don't think anything can help as much as a prayer can help at, in this situation and just, uh, just pray for their health and the strength um, so they can cope with this amount of pressure and hard work. And what about your parents' reaction? I mean, did they at any point ever said that resign or something like that? Yeah, I'm going to be honest and say at first we were very stressed and um, my uh, mom, especially, she asked my sister to resign and leave her job. And uh, she was thinking about it as well, but we just started praying for her. And uh, we've seen God's goodness, to be honest, because I do, I truly believe that if you're not blessed, you cannot be a doctor or a nurse. It's, it's a very, very um, hard job to do. And um, yeah, we did ask her to resign, but she agreed at first but then she changed her mind and said no this is my job this is what i'm passionate about i'm gonna go and do it and do my best and after some time uh, my mom was okay and she she actually asked my sister just make sure you do your best fair enough let me let it know. it's nice to hear actually from the family side as well um, let me go back to Dr. Mehta and then probably ask him about what go from the doctor's side. Uh, when all this happens, what goes on in, in doctor's mind and how do they come out of the stress? Because it's not easy to, to, to go through all this process and seeing so many people dying and then all this. I mean, what goes on in a doctor's mind, if I may ask? Can I start by saying that you know Tahir's sister who is a nurse and Tahir has expressed her feelings which is so real so as a doctor or as a nurse or those healthcare workers who are in front line they are actually fighting against a unknown enemy unseen enemy so you can't see this virus but you know it's around and you can get it anytime. So what goes in doctor's mind? Uh, Anik has been there. <laughs> so Anik can probably explain it better. But uh, you know, there is first of all dilemma. Dilemma is your own health. Are you going to get the virus? If you get it, how serious is going to be? Are you going to die? If you are going to die, what happens to your family? The second thing that comes in mind is if you have the virus, you go home, can your family get it? What happens to them? Are they going to die? And what happens to other contacts? So this fear, the anxiety. So there is quite a serious psychological trauma. 
but also equally importantly, as Tahir mentioned about her sister, your duty as a doctor or a nurse to your patient. You have a Hippocratic oath that you do the best for your patient. So are you worried about your own life or are you worried about your patient's life? How much care? How are you going to serve this patient? So it, it is actually very complicated and very serious issue. And you know um, that it is likely when this ends, at least the first wave, I'm sure there is going to be second and maybe third wave. We don't know how long this is going to go on. But it's, there is going to be what is called post-traumatic psychological syndrome that when initial phase is finished and when these all doctors and nurses are relieved from their duty to treat coronavirus disease, they would then reflect on it and some of them could have quite serious psychological effect. So it's very complicated and I'm sure we have to uh, you know, salute these frontline healthcare workers. And we have noticed that public have recognized this. And the clapping on Thursday evenings have been a moral boost for these doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers. But it is not easy. Well, very interesting to hear that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, we have been clapping every Thursday outside our houses, but now I think the clapping is going to be slightly harder than what it used to be after listening to uh, the, the, the experience, first-hand experience from Behi, from uh, Ash, from Anik, and from yourself. Let me let me move on to Anik for a uh, next question. Where I mean, he he has been. Um, working with Norfolk Park, where I think there have been a number of deaths, about 20 people dying every day. Uh, it must have been very stressful, uh, if I'm not wrong. And I just want to know how you keep uh, keep up yourself. I mean, how do you maintain the stress level low? What do you do? Do you do anything special to bring your stress level down? And I, I heard that you also had a coronavirus at some point yourself. Is that right? And one more thing I can add on to it. You're staying in a hotel at the moment. I am. Um, I am. Tell us a bit more about that, please. Sure. So, um, so just to reiterate both what Ash and also what Dr. Meta said, it has been quite a frightening time initially, at least well in the beginning of this pandemic. So as doctors, we are this is in fact almost sounds like an interview question. How do you deal with stress? This is something that we're almost um, used to dealing with. So right from the beginning during medical school, one of the interview questions is how do you deal with stress? So from the beginning, it's been ingrained in us. You, as a doctor, you need to be able to deal with stress. You need to be able to uh, face adversity and be able to adapt to different situations. And up till now, I think we've been doing pretty, pretty sort of, I'm one to usually deal with stress. Um, I usually like to for me, stress is, I use it as a positive and I try to ensure that it motivates me even more to work harder. But during this pandemic, it's almost redefined what it means to be working in a stressful environment. I still remember vividly one of my first shifts working on a coronavirus ward where um, this is after five o'clock, usually from nine till five, the wards are pretty well staffed. Um, but from five onward, there's usually only one doctor and then you've got obviously got all your nurses on the ward as well. But this one particular evening shift, I remember we had almost um, 12 patients out of about 15, 16 that were acutely deteriorating. So normally when you're on an on-call shift, you may be occasionally leaped by the nurse to ask, oh, doctor, this patient's deteriorating. Can you come and review this patient? And that's quite easy to deal with because you can focus all of your efforts into that one patient and try to ensure that patient stays safe during your shift. And obviously you can appropriately escalate um, 
to senior uh, colleagues and also get help from other colleagues as well. But this particular shift, I had 12 patients and I was looking after all these patients on this ward that were deteriorating at the same time. And they're all deteriorating from coronavirus. So where before you would have just have one patient that's deteriorating, you can put all your effort into it. Now you've got 12 patients that are deteriorating. And I'm in the situation where I'm like, how am I going to possibly cope with seeing all of these patients? Who do I see first? Who do I prioritize? And what do I do for these patients? Because as we know, there's no simple fix for um, coronavirus. And the other issue is in terms of who do you escalate to? So pre-COVID times, anyone that was unwell on the wards, you could almost preempt and try to get them in a place of safety before they deteriorate. It's all about preemptive management. So suppose somebody's got a low blood pressure on the ward. You could speak to, for instance, Ash was in ITU intensive care. You can ask your ITU colleagues and ask them, look, I'm worried about this patient. I think they need to be somewhere where we can monitor them, monitor, monitor them more closely. But when you're in a setting where you've got so many patients deteriorating, you simply cannot refer every single patient to ITU to get help because ITU and HDU, high dependency unit, they all have limited resources. So we reached a point where our intensivist colleagues would only review those patients that were almost on the on death's door, essentially. So the, every day we would almost have a situation where the criteria to actually refer to intensive care were changing. So before it would be, if you see a patient and their breathing rate is above such and such and such, only then call intensive care. Otherwise, you need to manage this patient yourself. And every day that number kept going up and up. And maybe back in January, those numbers would be completely different. But the point being is, you're in a situation where um, you have to deal with the situation yourself. You've got limited resources and only the sickest of the sickest will be allowed to go into intensive care. So I remember being extremely frightened that particular shift and I got all the nurses huddled together and I said, look, it's just not possible for me to review every single patient right now. I need to know right now exactly what each patient's oxygen level is and what their breathing rate is and prioritize who I see based on that. But before coronavirus, anyone would a bit of a low oxygen level, I would have to review. But here I'm facing a situation where I can't do that. I really do need to prioritize. So that's one thing. So it's about being um, overwhelmed with the sheer responsibility of looking after all of these patients. Um, it's also been very, uh, I don't usually get uh, uh, sort of, I don't outwardly express how uh, sort of my emotions whilst I'm at the hospital, you just have to deal with it. But there have been many occasions where it's really made me feel really upset seeing patients deteriorate, them not being able to see their loved ones. I remember having to deal with one patient. He grabbed my hand initially and he said, doctor, I've got two young kids and this unfortunate patient um, actually lived alone in, in this country. All of his relatives were in India. And he said, I cannot. And he, he almost instinctively knew he was not going to make it. He grabbed my head and said, doctor, you need to make sure uh, I walk out of hospital alive. I've got two young kids. My wife is dependent on me. And if I don't make it, what will happen to them? And you can see the fear in, in these patients' eyes. But as a doctor, you can't. And I'm obviously very fearful as well, because I knew day on day he's deteriorating. But I can't express that sort of fear to him as well. So you have to... Um, you do have to instill confidence in them. And back to what, when the doctor said to Ash as well, that what do we do now? I almost reached that point as well, because what do we do? We can't sort of magically cure these patients. And it's so hard to predict what will happen to which patient. One minute they're talking to you and the next, they literally with coronavirus, what happens is these patients go off very quickly. So one minute they're just sitting on the ward, talking in full sentences. And honestly, 30 minutes later, they could be so short of breath that you need to put out crash calls. That's how that's one of the key features of this virus. What it does is it these patients go off very quickly and that's very frightening. So all of this does have its um, uh, emotional toll on you. Um, and so ask answering your question, how do I deal with the stress? Well, um, 
for me, it's about making sure that, first of all, this knowing and realizing that this is uh, your job and it is your duty, you have to deal with this. Uh, and secondly, the fact that you're trying to get these patients better so you can't let stress or emotions get in the way. Um, outside of work, I do have a lot of interests, so I do keep myself distracted. Um, I also run a couple of businesses at the moment. So after work, I usually focus my efforts on, on running the business, but also I enjoy playing sports. Uh, and I think all of this helps to uh, take your mind off the, uh, the emotional burden when you're at work. Mm -hmm. And how, what, what was the family reaction during this time? I mean, how the family has reacted? Um, it's been really sad to see uh, family members, obviously patients are uh, passing away, visitors are not allowed to see their relatives. Um, so it's um, it's been really difficult for the, the relatives, particularly because so many patients uh, would be at the uh, end of their life and not having anyone beside them is a frightening experience for them, but also a frightening experience for the relatives. I remember there was one patient who also had the virus and the wife hadn't actually seen the patient in almost two, three weeks. And um, whilst we do have iPads now and nurses can help facilitate relatives seeing their loved ones, at the beginning, no wards had iPads. And so we faced a situation where these relatives were not able to see their relatives, but also, we did not have that technology. That's only uh, in the last two or three weeks or so. So I remember uh, I, and again, uh, nursing staff were also very um, sort of, our matrons were very reluctant for us to take in mobile phones inside because of contamination issues. I remember one patient, he was very confused and um, we were quite concerned at how quickly he was getting confused. Uh, he wouldn't be eating, he wouldn't be drinking. And when we'd give these daily updates to his wife, she just was completely um, in sort of dismay thinking, why can't I see my husband? I just want to hear his voice. So I made an effort to actually get the wife to speak to the husband. And I remember when the wife heard um, her husband's voice for the first time after three weeks, she just broke into tears and was like, oh, um, I can't quite remember his name, but should be crying and saying, I haven't heard you in ages. I miss you. Please get better. I can't live without you. She's in her, in her 70s. And this patient was very confused for the first time after hearing her um, his wife's voice actually started responding appropriately. And that's something very different to what we observed um, in the hours before. People are asking different questions. There is a question actually, uh, if patients are allowed to use their phones uh, in the ICU? Uh, so, so if patients have their own phone, they can, but if they're in an intensive care setting, quite often they're already going to be, um, they're probably going to be in an induced coma, so they can't physically call. Uh, if they're on the ward and they're uh, obviously fully conscious, then they can call themselves. But in the peak of this uh, pandemic, because the patients are so unwell, they just wouldn't be able to speak uh, to their relatives. Hmm. There's another question saying, are there any restrictions or recommendations in place for pregnant healthcare workers? I'm sure there must be some. They're, they're very fragile. Yeah. So, so I think the, uh, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be able to answer this because I, I don't know the actual uh, the, the recommendations, but generally if you're um, immunosuppressed, you should generally stay away. So I'm not sure whether pregnant women um, would fall into that category. And there's another question for you, Dr. Anik. Uh, it says, can Dr. Anik hey, tell us if things in the hospitals are improving and have doctors got enough support and PPE? Uh, so I think the situation is definitely improving. So at Northwick Park, we um, the last so I'm a night, so I've been off for a few days, but um, we haven't had a COVID admission in at least a couple of days. So uh, in fact, um, 
a lot of wards are now shifting back to how they were previously. So what happened during COVID times is a lot of specialty wards would be changed into COVID wards, so coronavirus wards. And um, now we're having a situation where we've got a lot of empty beds. We just don't have many patients actually admitted with coronavirus. So that's very reassuring from that front. So things are improving. Secondly, we do have a lot of support and uh, PPE, the sort of, um, the, the problem when people ask, is there enough or adequate PPE? You also have to understand what is adequate PPE. And that's obviously going to be guided by what Public Health England have said. So initially when, um, during the pandemic, PPE was the full gear, meaning you have to wear um, surgical aprons, you have to wear um, gloves, a shield, uh, but gradually throughout sort of um, during this pandemic, things have changed. And adequate PPE is now simply, for instance, if you're not in a setting where you're doing aerosol generating procedures. So that's essentially, if you're not in a setting where you're dealing with a procedure, if I'm being grossly simple, if I'm being grossly um, if I'm grossly simplifying it, if you're not doing a procedure and you're just in a, in a coronavirus ward, you just need to wear a, 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 a surgical mask and aprons, and that's adequate. Well, we've got a question for Dr. Mehta here. Actually, somebody is mentioning Shafalika. Uh, she's saying that Dr. Mehta does not have the correct information on Indian doctor's death. So maybe we, we can check. I'm not sure, Dr. Mehta, would you like to comment on that? Um, well, uh, she may have correct information, so I can't vouch that I have absolutely correct information. Fair enough, fair enough. We will check that. The other thing is, Vineet, sorry, Vineet, things do change on a day to day basis. So, exactly. what Dr. Method's obviously um, commenting on are published data. So, if you've got, for instance, uh, if you've got first hand information that may have not been published yet, fair enough. Yeah. And there's another one, is hard immunity is possible solution? Are you asking whom? Uh, Dr. Mehta, would you like to take that one? Um, is it a possible solution? Yes, it is a possible solution. But for herd immunity to happen, it's going to take a few years. So the better solution uh, before that is vaccine, uh, if it's available which may be another year or so. Hmm. Okay. Well, okay, thank you very much, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, this was so nice to hear everybody's experience. I'm going to play a short video, and once we have watched the video, I'll come back, and I will ask every, every speaker to say a few words about what they see in the video, probably about 20 seconds, 30 seconds each. So let me quickly play that video. Can we possibly start from you, Dr. Mehta? What do you think of what was going on in the video? We had a lot of people gathering all over the place. What do you think? What would be what your message is going to be to people? Well, I need to come back to um, Ash. You know, he thought he is very fit. He cannot get virus. I think you know people are very ignorant if they believe that they are not going to get this virus. Social distancing is so crucially important. This is a virus which is nothing like any other viruses we have seen over the years. So please, this is no time to be getting too close to people. Social distancing, two meters, and washing hands, absolutely crucial. Pranik, would you like to add anything to that? I, I, I really do echo what Dr. Mehta said, really. 
Um, it's because when people don't realize the full seriousness of the issue that they can do that and they think they're not going to get affected. Only if you're affected or you see a loved one that's affected, do you truly appreciate the implications of, for instance, not abiding by social distancing. So I can understand why people do it. Um, in the beginning, I also, uh, even as a doctor, for instance, I wasn't truly able to appreciate the significance until I, I realized how overwhelmed I was with the number of patients who were being admitted. So I'm seeing this and that's why I truly appreciate it. So I see both sides. I understand, Obviously, it's extremely important for us to be able to socially distance. Um, and it's really also making sure that we abide by what government also say as well. And what would you like to say, Ash, uh, having gone through all that, what would you like to say to people? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, just to um, following on from Alex's comment, you know, it's a week before I went in, I was actually joking with friends saying that I thought the virus was a conspiracy theory. And because I said, do you, do you actually know anyone who's got it? Because at the time, I didn't know anyone who had the virus. So, you know, I was joking, thinking it was some sort of conspiracy theory. The media were hyping it up. And then, uh, you know, Sod's Law, that the first person I actually find out that I personally know who uh, contracted the disease was, was myself. So it is one of those things where unless you know someone who's close to you, who's a friend or a family who's actually been through it, it's hard to kind of relate to the disease. But, uh, you know, 100 percent, it's not fake news. It's out there. Uh, people have died. Um, and then even as far as kind of people recovering from the virus, um, you know, since, so I've been out, I've been home about a month now, I got discharged. Um, I, I lost 15 kg in weight when I was in hospital, I couldn't walk. Um, I was on medication. And, and it, now I'm off medication. It's like back at square one, like where the body just kind of recover and so on. And it's probably going to be about another two months. But I've heard about, um, sorry, another two months before I'm 100%. But I've even heard about patients who've recovered from coronavirus who've gone home, and then within uh, you know four four to six weeks have passed away through uh, contracting pneumonia. So even then, because your immune system is quite low, you're still exposed. So it's a, it's a very serious disease. And I think it's you know watching that video uh, and seeing people. I get it as well. Look, you know, I, especially you know I was born in the country. I, I've lived here all my life. I, I I totally understand. We only get sunshine a certain amount of time throughout the year. So you know to keep us trapped indoors is is quite a challenge. So I understand that sun's out, you know, we've, we've got to get out there and get as much as possible, especially in the Asian community where we need our extra vitamin D uh, overload, you know. So, um, but, I, you know, like, like I said, even when I got discharged from hospital, I, I had immediate family who couldn't even come and see me. And, and it's not because they, they don't care and they don't love. It's just we have to take the right precaution in this time. Um, you know, we were talking about the numbers that decreased uh, in the hospitals, and I've been told the same information that, that – coronavirus victims are, are getting lower, but maybe a major factor towards that reason is um, because of social distancing, because we've had these rules of lockdown and suddenly lifting those those uh, kind of rules, uh, are we gonna see an increase again? Uh, maybe, but but the bottom line is, I think, um, you know, 100%, it's a, it's a serious disease. Um, it, it takes, it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter how fit you are, it, you know, if it gets you, it's gonna it's gonna go for you, and uh, so I think we have to take extra caution. You know, wear your masks, wear your gloves, keep your distance, even with loved ones. And I know it's tough right now to kind of not see your family members, um, but really, if if you care about them, it's it, you know, it's the best thing you could do for them is to kind of like keep away from them right now. You know, till uh, till things get a little bit. Better. And Bahi, would you like to add anything quickly to that? Um, everyone explained it very well, but I really do think that people need to take this virus seriously because it's a serious situation that we have to, I think everyone, like every single person needs to work together and uh, just um, social distancing and um, staying home. I know it's boring and uh, it's been three months and already we had enough, but we have to stay strong and um, continue this. And obviously washing hands, everything, like we have to take this very seriously and hopefully we get through this. Sure. 
Well, um, we heard from all the panelists and they all have agreed that following social distancing rule is very, very important. Uh, the lockdown rules are unlocking, but it doesn't mean uh, that uh, they have found the cure. It only means, as Anik, uh, Dr. Anik mentioned, that they have extra beds now. So if you want to break the rules, uh, Dr. Anik might be waiting for you in the hospital, which obviously is not the best choice. So thank you very much for joining me, all the panelists and all the people who are watching and sending their comments. I uh, hope you enjoyed the show and uh, we'll take care and have a good evening. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.